Well, it's a very great pleasure to have the next speaker, Heiko Dietrich from uh, Monash University. Uh, he's going to talk about a, a topic of great interest to me. So, Galois trees for P groups of maximal class. Over to you, Heiko, please. All right. Thank you, Stephen, and hello, everyone. Yes, so my talk is about a long term research project I'm involved in now for almost 15 years, um, namely how to classify P groups by co class. And today I give an update on some recent progress for maximal class groups. In particular, I try to focus on a couple of details that I usually don't mention in talks. So, so let's see how this goes. So what's a group of maximal class? Well, that's a P group of order P to the N that has the potency class N minus one. So the lower central series has exactly N terms and all the sections are essentially cyclic of order P except the first one. Now these groups have been studied significantly in the literature. I want to focus on one piece of work here from Norman Blackburn, um, who also classified the two and three groups of maximal class in terms of presentations. So for example, it is known that there are essentially three infinite families of two groups of maximal class, namely the dihedral groups of two power order, semi-dihedral and quaternion um, groups of two power order, and similarly for the, th the three groups of maximal class. And as I said, these groups have been studied extensively. If you pick your favorite book on group theory, um, there's most likely a section on maximal class groups. Um, and there are very intricate properties of these groups now. And for example, I highlighted just one, maximal class is equivalent to having a large conjugacy class. So you find many of these results in, in standard books, and I've noted here some other papers that will be relevant later. But despite all these results, a classification in the vein of Blackburn's classifications are still not known. So in the sense of having finitely many presentations. And this question really drives this research. We want to understand you know, how to classify these groups. And also I should say that nowadays maximal class is part of a much broader research project in the co-class theory that generalizes maximal class. So co-class one is essentially exactly the case of maximal class. I don't go into detail here in this talk. I just want to mention that the results I mentioned on the following probably five slides or so they are all standard in co-class theory. And as a general reference, I would refer to the book of Leet and Green and, and McKay. Okay, a quite crucial tool in this area is the co-class graph. Um, so what's that? Well, it's the visualization of all the groups in this context here of maximal class. So we have an infinite graph where the vertices are exactly the P groups of maximal class up to isomorphism. And we have an edge from G to H, if G is the central quotient of H. As I said, Blackburn classified the two and three groups of maximal class, and consequently, we can draw these graphs. It's an infinite graph. And as I said, there are these three families of dihedral, semi-dihedral, and quaternion um, groups of two power order. And it's a very nice structure, right? And for G3, it looks pretty similar. So also here, we have well, basically one isolated group, which is the cyclic group, order P square, and then we have this infinite infinite graph here. And I just want to highlight already that you see that these graphs have a lot of structure. Now we have one infinite path here, and then going down from this path, we have these finite subtrees that have a lot of well, periodic behavior. The graph G5 is to some understand well understood. I um, will show some bits and pieces later on, but for P greater than five, it's, it's pretty wild. So you can't, you can't even draw significant parts of it. So one focus in co-class theory is now on understanding these graphs a little bit better because this turned out to be a very fruitful approach. And the first thing I want to look at is these infinite path here. So what about infinite path? For this, we need the notion of degree of commutativity. As I said, all this is well known, but I just want to introduce it to highlight a particular aspect. So let's take a group of maximal class. We have its lower central series terms, and let's extend this by one additional term, which is called the two-step centralizer. The degree of commutativity essentially measures how far commutation goes down in this chain. Yeah? So this is this um, integer LG here. If gamma one happens to be a billion, then it's said that the degree of commutativity is N minus three. Now throughout the talk, we assume that the degree of commutativity is positive. And this, this is a fair assumption because of work of Fernandez Alcoba. There are estimates for the degree of commutativity. And in particular, as you see here, the degree grows linearly with the exponent n of, of the group order. So if, if the order is large enough, 
the degree of commutativity grows. Another important consequence is the following. If, if you look at your graph and you have a group that has a descendant, then two things hold. Firstly, this group G is actually a split extension of your gamma one, of your two-step centralizer. So there is some element of order P outside, and we have this um, normal subgroup index P here, split extension. And secondly, if gamma one is non-abelian, then the degree of commutativity of the descendant is less equal, the original degree of commutativity. And this tells us one thing. If your group is on an infinite path, then it follows that gamma one must be abelian. If the group is on an infinite path, gamma one must be abelian. So we have this split extension here of an abelian group by some cyclic group of order P. And this is now the key for describing these groups using algebraic number theory. So choose a primitive p root of unity over the um, p adic rationals. Let O be the ring of integers of that field and let P be its maximal idea. Then one can show that this split extension is isomorphic to the split extension where theta acts by multiplication on this quotient. And, and, and this is really a nice description of, of all these groups on the infinite path. It tells us that this infinite path is essentially defined by an infinite so-called space group of maximal class. Right? It's this theta acting by multiplication on this um, ring of integers. And this group S here plays a very important role in the study of, of P groups by co-class. And as I said, today I want to focus a little bit on this group and explain why this is so, so important. So this guy tells us basically what the terms on this infinite path are. Everything else which comes off of this path then is in a finite subtree, right? because there is no other infinite path. So what about these um, groups? These groups form what's called branches. So we have this infinite path, and going down from this infinite path, we have finite subtrees, and these are called the branches. The degree of commutativity again tells us that these branches, which we know must be finite, have bounded depth. So there's an upper bound on the depth of these branches. And now let's look at the following. Take a group in that branch. Let's suppose this group has order p to the n plus e. So because it's in the branch Bn, we know it has the main line group Sn as a quotient. Right? That's, that's just by definition. If E is not big enough, then again, the degree of commutativity allows us to prove something quite remarkable. It allows us to prove that this normal subgroup, which we quotient out here, is also abelian. And it's acted upon trivially by gamma 1. And this, in turn, allows us to prove that this gamma n is isomorphic to this section of our pro P group S. And this is a crucial fact, really. It, it tells us that groups that are in these branches not deep enough, they are all extensions of a quotient of the space group by a section of the space group. And it, it really explains why this space group is, so to speak, the grandmother of most groups in these branches, because you can construct most of them as, as suitable extensions. So focus really is on understanding this group and and its finite quotients and extension. And this also motivates why one wants to look at pruned branches. Yeah? So basically in co-class theory, we first focus on those groups that are extensions of that great um, pro P group. The bottom of these branches is a bit more complicated. So, so let P be this pruned branch where all the groups are coming from the pro P group. So this is how it looks like. We have our cyclic group, we have our branches, we have the pruned branches. Um, the difference in depth is bounded by constant in P, so we don't actually neglect too many groups. And then what can we observe? We have seen it for G3 and G2 that these branches seem to occur with some periodicity. And in fact, this has been known to well, many researchers so far. So Mike Newman did a lot of work on this, Eamon O'Brien, Charles Eaton Green, and Sue McKay. They basically observed and, and in some instances proved that the top part of each branch is isomorphic to the top part of some branch further down. And, and this further down is basically specified by some periodicity, which always happens to be P minus one. In most generality, this has been proved by Marcus de Sorto and then by Bettina Eichen leading green constructively. Focusing on maximal class, I've um, improved this a bit further. I've basically shown that the whole prune, prune branch is isomorphic to the top part of a pruned branch further down. Um, and this has been proved on a group theoretic level using cohomology groups and, and solving the isomorphism problem for these group extensions. 
involves the automorphism group of the space group. And why do I mention this? Well, because again, I just highlight that this space group S plays a huge role. Not only can we construct the groups um, using its sections and subsections, but also the isomorphism problem can be solved by acting with its automorphism. Group. So it's, it's just great um, how much information this pro P group contains. <clears throat> so here's an example for G5. You see two branches here. As I said, these branches are much more complicated for G2 and than for G2 and G3. So this is one branch, this is another branch using a compact notation already. So there's a number next to each vertex. And this number indicates how many additional ch children this vertex has, but these children, these children don't have further children, so they're terminal. So just to save space, we write on the number of descendants. And you can observe now that the top part of, S, of, of B13 really is the same as the top part of uh, uh, B17. Right, which is the first periodicity. But you can also observe that the branch B17 is longer. It has grown in depth compared to B13. Right? So this already indicates that the first periodicity isn't enough to describe these branches. However, it's easy to see that the structure of the gr growing part is pretty much the same of what we see above. So there seems to be an additional periodicity going on that describes how these branches grow. And this, or these computer investigations are really um, well, the main reason for the central conjecture. So the central conjecture is that the Coplas graph GP can be described by finite subgraph and periodic patterns. And also similar to Blackburn's work that the groups can be classified by finitely many presentations. This is the main conjecture. And the problem, the outstanding problem really is to describe how these branches grow in some well-defined periodic way. So this is basically one prune branch which maps onto the other prune branch here, but then we have to describe how does this branch grow. So we have to describe the descendant tree of this group on the bottom level here. Based on computer experiments, um, we conjecture or just conjectured in the area that this descendant tree is essentially isomorphic to a descendant tree of some group further up. Huh? So we can use existing information to describe the growth of the branches. This is the main conjecture, but the problem is really how, how do you find this group H? How do you find this, this periodic parent? A promising idea is to do the following, you know, here's G, we just go up these steps and then we use the first periodicity, find a group H and then take this descendant tree and hope for the best. Now this works in many cases. For example, if the automorphism group of H is a P group and P is pronged in five modulo six, but in, unfortunately in general, this doesn't always seem to work. Um, and my previous PhD student, Shubha Jyoti he has made this more explicit. He found examples where this really doesn't work. So that's the main problem right now. And the crux to this is really to understand how to describe descendants of a group. And I want to briefly talk about that again, because the space group plays an important role here. So Charles Leeton Green and Sumer K, they've defined what's called constructible groups, um, which are now called skeleton groups in a much more general context. For maximal class, it turns out that the skeleton groups are exactly those groups that have descendants, which is very nice. Uh, actually, I made this explicit in my, in my doctoral thesis. So the groups in the prune branch that have descendants are skeleton groups. So what's a skeleton group? Well, remember the groups on the infinite path, they are just these the important quotients of our P group, right? A skeleton group is just a sort of twisted version of that. So what's meant by this? Well, we take this group, and we change the multiplication or the addition of this normal subgroup a bit. So specifically, we take a homomorphism from the exterior square of O into some suitable um, subgroup here. And then we take the original um, mainline group, and this would be the original addition. And what we do now is we change this addition by introducing this twisting term. This is what we do. And this happens to be a skeleton group in the maximal class case. So all the skeleton groups, all the groups that have descendants in all prune branches are of this form. Now this still might st still look quite technical, but it's much nicer than the general case where you don't know anything about the group. So skeleton groups have three advantages really. Firstly, they literally form the skeleton. These are the groups that have descendants. Secondly, there's a quite explicit construction parameterized by homomorphisms. And thirdly, that this leads to um, a much simplified isomorphism problem of these groups. 
And this motivates why we want to focus on skeletons um, in the following. And again, all this comes from the space group. So this space group S really has a huge bearing on, on the structure and um, shape of this graph. Now, let me talk about the new stuff. Um, remember, I did say on the previous slide that if the automorphism group of H is a P group, then basically we find a periodic parent or, or, or twin, whatever we want to call this. Um, this motivated us to look at the following. And by we, I mean uh, my collaborators, Alexander Kant, Bettina Eick, myself, and Tobias Möhle. We defined the Galois order of a group in this graph to be the P prime part of its automorphism group. And two things to mention, if the group is not a root of a branch, then the Galois order always divides P minus one. And if you have a descendant in that branch, then the Galois order of the descendant divides the Galois order of the original group. That's a quite nice thing, which allows us to define Galois trees. So it's basically a tree within the pruned skeleton where all the groups have the same Galois order and this tree is as large as possible. So you can't extend this up and down. So the whole skeleton is partitioned by these Galois trees. So far, so good. We can make this definition, but is it any good? Well, it's, it all started when Bettina Eick and I looked at the maximum possible Galois order, which is P minus one. So just for the sake of the next slides, let's call um, these Galois trees, um, let's denote a star, just to indicate that we only look at groups that have maximum possible Galois order. And we also included the root of the branch, which technically has Galois order P minus one squared. So what do we do in computational group theory? We do examples. And here are some examples. This is, um, these are some branches for P equals seven. So let me explain that. The whole thing you see is the whole branch where we focused on Galois order six. The black part on the top is the um, pruned skeleton. If you see a number on the right, it means we have this many terminal groups. And importantly, if you see a number on the left, then this means there's a ramification level. So you have to make this many copies of the vertex and its sub tree. And this already indicates one problem. Once we computed these graphs, it was a mess because there are many ramification levels, there are many groups. It's really only when you have a compact form that you can see that these graphs are actually really nice and there's a lot of periodicity happening. For example, you see that these um, ramifications always seem to be seven. Huh? Like even here, this, this group has seven descendants, one, five, one, this group has seven descendants and so on. So ramifications are always seven and these ramification levels seem to happen also with periodicity six. So there's a lot of structure when you look at these graphs in the right form. So we made these conjectures <coughs> for maximal Galois order that these are exactly the structures of the um, Galois trees for P equals seven. And here we have done P11. So maybe don't focus on the details here. It's just a precise description of what we see and, and then have conjectured. And surprisingly, we managed to prove all that. So this is our 2017 paper. We proved that these Galois trees really look like what we have conjectured, conjectured. And what I want to highlight here is maybe just that it's a, an excellent example of how computer experiments enhance the theory. If we wouldn't have done these experiments, we wouldn't have seen these patterns and we probably would have never, never proved them. So this was all for maximal Galois order. Why is this relevant? Well, it's actually the first periodicity result that considers co-class branches of unbounded depth and width. That's what it makes significant. And, and in particular, because it was so great for maximal Galois order, we decided to look at other Galois orders. And it turned out to be also quite fruitful. So this is my last slide, really. This is what we have proved um, out, out of the press. Um, choose any Galois order and take a Galois tree in your skeleton. The first thing we showed is that this Galois tree has maximum possible depth. So basically you can extend every vertex to a group that is on the bottom of your skeleton. Yeah, so every Galois tree goes to the bottom of your skeleton, which by itself sounds like a technical property, which, which it probably is, but it allowed us to prove the very first periodicity result for growing um, branches, namely the following. It basically solved the conjecture in my PH, um, well, PhD thesis. Namely, we proved that for the pruned branches, this second periodicity, which we conjectured earlier, holds. Yeah? So for every group at the level described here, there is a group D steps further up coming from a previous um, 
previous branch, such that these, such that these descendant trees are isomorphic. We also have a construction of how to get these. And yeah, so this really is a significant result because it's the very first result that, that describes these growing branches for arbitrary growing um, co-class branches under the assumption that the prime is congruent 5 model 6, unfortunately. We also looked at um, Galois trees themselves. And for example, we proved that um, the number of immediate descendants is always a power of P. We have shown that ramification levels occur with periodicity D. And we have shown that roots of Galois trees, they occur with periodicity D. So because of an emergency and running out of time, I press this button here and go to the conclusion side. Um, so the conclusion is really that looking at these Galois trees has been very fruitful. It seems to be a very good idea to partition your graph into these Galois trees. It allowed us to have a simplified construction and description of skeleton groups, which I skipped, which allowed us in turn to have a simplified isomorphism test and to prove new periodicity results. So we are quite optimistic that we can hopefully extend this also to the other case, congruent one modulo P, and eventually also to describe these um, groups in terms of parameterized group presentations. So there's still a lot of work to, to be done, but I think the, the idea is really promising. Okay, so I think I stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much.